Greetings, gentle viewers, and welcome back to Graveyards of Arkham. My name is Mark Beer, and it is my grim pleasure to serve as your keeper of arcane lore. But as we know, a keeper is nothing without their players. Let's meet them now. I'm Josephine McAdam, and I'll be playing Detective Vic Mason. I'm Lucy Eversprilly, and I will be playing Theodore Holt. I'm Nora Ibrahim, and I'm playing Big Betty Briggs. Patrick Logan, Dr. Archibald Desmond. On the premiere episode of Graveyards of Arkham, our investigators encountered horrors and experienced the death of a friend, Wallace Phillips. You stand now by the side of his grave, walking away with traces of the earth which you threw on his coffin, still sticking to your hands. The mourners file along the pathway, some stopping to chat or commiserate, others making their way back to their lives. The crowd is not fully dispersed, and you are among them. What would you like to do? I'd like to actually scan the crowd of who showed up to the funeral. There are a number of policemen in uniform dress uniforms. There are older folk and some of the wealthier citizens of Arkham are in attendance as well. Could I get a spot hidden from you, Vic? It's a failure. <laughs> Many faces, most downcast. Wallace Phillips was well respected, though he never received promotions in Arkham's corrupt police department. He was known as the one good cop in this town. And that's probably what stood in his way. Nevertheless, there are many who seem genuinely touched by his passing. Whoever's responsible for this is probably here. Do you see anybody that looks suspicious? I look specifically at the wealthy to see if any of them seem out of place or match any of the descriptions that we saw previously. Yes, you did hear tell of a well-dressed young gentleman who had been seen in conversation uh, with both Anna and her brother Carl. Do I see anybody who could possibly fit that description or persons in that case? Again, Anna was quite young, so you're assuming the young man in question was probably around her age. Somewhere between the ages of, I'd say, 20 to no older than 36 to 37. You don't necessarily see any well-dressed young gentleman that fit that description. There are some younger policemen. Mm. It's likely they didn't even know Wallace Phillips before his retirement, but again, they may have attended simply because of his reputation. Mm. Some of these younger cops are perhaps a little more optimistic than their colleagues. Perhaps they see something of a role model in Wallace Phillips. There are, as mentioned, uh, some wealthy folk. You do see a couple standing, a man in a black morning coat and a top hat, an imposing man with thick chestnut hair, strong chiseled face and an immaculately trimmed mustache. He's chatting to the priest, as a matter of fact. And the woman standing with him is quite striking, a luminous beauty, even at this distance. You feel a tug on your sleeve and see a middle-aged woman. Uh, you were friends of Wally's? Uh, yes, we were actually um, assisting him in certain affairs. He was acting on independently. Oh, his history of Arkham. Yes, yeah, something like that, yes. Such terrible shame about Wally. I mean, I didn't really know him, but everyone spoke so highly of him. I hear he hadn't been well. No, in a manner of speaking. Hmm. Well, these cops all die before their time. Sooner or later, it catches up with you, you know? I'm sorry, who are you? Oh, uh, Mary, Mary Simpson. I, I'm a typist and filing clerk at the police department. Again, I, I just wanted to come to pay my respects. Got it. She smiles, sadly, moves on. 
You hear a few other snatches of conversation. Some have moved on to general topics, such as when will prohibition end? It's doing no good, just making money for the gangs. Someone complaining about how hard it is to find apartments in Arkham now that the students are renting all the rooms. Someone mentions that there are a lot of rough sleepers in Independent Square these days. And the other person replies that a mad vagrant had been seen in Potter's Field. They think the police should move him on. At this point, you see the man that you observed speaking to the priest earlier, walking towards you with the lady. Ah, friends of Mr. Phillips, I take it. Yes, and you are, sir? Ah, Jefferson Holbrook. <laughs> Terrible thing. Still, I suppose the Reaper comes for us all, hmm? Yes, and um, my name is uh, Archibald Desmond, and I have to the rest of my associates. Charmed, charmed. Uh, this is my wife, <coughs> Nancy. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. At this distance, you're all struck by her luminous beauty. She's immaculately dressed and genteel in voice and gesture, but what's most striking is that her skin doesn't seem to have any lines or blemishes. If anyone would like to make a spot hidden. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's her? So consistently great at mm -hmm. those. The skincare regime here. <laughs> success. Success. Hard success. Note that she is not wearing any makeup. Hmm. Flawless skin. Apologies, Mr. Holmes. How exactly did you know? Uh, Holmes? Oh, uh, no. My name is Holbrook. Holbrook, sorry. Uh, Holbrook, sorry. Um, how did you know uh, the deceased? Ah, uh, well, mostly by reputation. Uh, again, honest men are hard to find. Particularly in, well, well, this line of work and this particular town. Very sad. Uh, my condolences on your loss. Of course. Uh, my, um, are you with the police department? Oh, uh, no, no, I'm a man of business myself. Oh, are you? Uh, what business would you have around here? Uh, textiles, to be honest. That's where the family fortune comes from. The Holbrooks have been well known in Arkham for some time. Do I know this guy? No, but you recently did hear the name Holbrook. That's the, that's the guy that, that Anna worked for. Um, sorry to trouble you on such an occasion as this, but we were in the process of actually assisting the deceased with... <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I know this might be sort of inappropriate uh, at this time, but I just have, and I'm looking at Nancy. Mm -hmm. I just have to say that your skin is radiant. She turns to face you, cocks her head to one side, seems to be considering for a moment. Thank you so much. Do That's you work very kind of at you. all? Hmm? Do you work at all? Oh, um, well, I would say work. <laughs> Oh, Not well. Skin like that. Your skin's like butter. What's your skincare regimen? Oh, uh, I suppose I'm blessed. Yeah, I'll say. So, I'm do you, you two live at that big fancy house? I'm big assuming? fancy house? Yeah. Oh, I suppose our house is fancy. Oh, no, no. Let's not uh, brag, dear. Yes, uh, yes. We, we're, uh, very fortunate, shall we say. I'm sure that is so nice to have it, but such a bother to clean, wouldn't you say? Oh, well, uh, we have help, of course. Oh, I've Service. actually been looking for good help. Do you have any recommendations? I run a- You had mentioned, yes. I run an inn um, on the outskirts of Arkham and- Really? How quaint. far too much to clean all by myself. I've been looking for a good maid, actually. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, well, good help is hard to find. You don't have any specific recommendations, name-wise, specific names? <laughs> no, uh, actually, yeah. uh, we did have a girl working for us, but, uh, well, it was a peculiar thing. 
she just up and left. Uh, we thought she was so happy with us. No idea where she went, though. To be honest, uh, she wasn't even with us that long. Perhaps life in service just wasn't for her. Well, it's not for everyone, dear. No, I, I suppose not. Uh, now, you said you were helping Mr. Phillips with some endeavor? Can you just psychology roll on that? Whole yeah, I'd thing like to as well. About Very well. Anna. Success. Success? Mm. Success. Success. They're not being truthful. Okay. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, well, uh, you know, he was working on that historical yes. book about Arkham. Really? That's why we were hanging out with him. And, you know, we met some really fancy ladies. He, she looks towards his wife. We met some really fancy ladies. Do you happen to work with the sisters of... of uh, the daughters. <laughs> checks notes. <laughs> daughters, the daughters of Grace. Grace. Yeah. Daughters she, of Grace. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she brightens up. Why, yes, I do. One likes to give back to the community, after all. Oh, sure. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, people blessed such as yourselves look like they got lots of uh, connections to charities and organizations. Uh, so, do you do you volunteer with the, the soup kitchen? Well, when I can, uh, I have other engagements, and well, one gets so busy, but. One does like to help. We certainly help financially when we can. Yeah, Arkham has actually, given us so much. That's actually such a good point. I'm just a little confused as to why a maid wouldn't be happy at your estate. It seems like you would pay them well. Mm, yes, well, who can fathom the minds of the youth, hmm? Can I... Can I, like, ascertain from the two of them? Do they have any, like... More than just her having like really clear skin, is there like something off with the two of them? Uh, no, we didn't get any extreme successes on the spot hidden, but does ha anyone have any art skills? Painting, <laughs> drawing, sculpture? Uh, Probably not me. <laughs> I don't think No. No. Anybody? Okay. I have <laughs> science of anatomy and biology. Would that count? Hmm. Oh. Yes. Okay, which one would it be? Uh, yeah, let's go with anatomy. Okay, that's the better one. Extreme success. Ooh. Extreme success. Yes. There we go. Interesting. As you're watching, as Nancy Holbrook speaks to your friends and to you, you realize, yes, that's why she's so beautiful. Her Features are perfectly balanced. One side of her face, the mirror image of the other. I am immediately somewhat unnerved. Yes, that's not what one tends to see in biology. Uh, in any case, once again, our condolences. Yes, yes, very sad and good day to you all. As you see them joining their driver, who's waiting for them at the gate, and they get into a car. Can we tail them? Do we have a car? Does anyone have a car? <laughs> <laughs> you could run after the car. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but how did we get here, though? Uh, it has been some <clears throat> days since your terrible discovery of the mm -hmm. body of Wallace Phillips. Yes, they're like a. And taxi? I should. Taxi? <laughs> yeah, some uh, taxi could certainly be hired. You are currently in Christchurch Cemetery, which, according to my handy map, is at about down here. And you also realize that this is the very cemetery that you encountered those things. Mm hmm. Maybe we can go, maybe the headstone is there of the person they were trying to loot. Not that, I don't know if that does anything since they just seem like they needed a body, but. I think we should be more worried about, you know, who coming to dig Wallace up. They were definitely hiding something. What they were saying about Anna was not truthful. Yeah, that was very suspicious. And then did you see that lady's part of the same kind of soup organization that we went to. Do you think she was in that photo? 
as the four of you stand, huddled in conversation, <laughs> you see a small, round man with a round face and a round head and small, round, wire-framed spectacles perched above a sparse mustache. Mm. Um, excuse me? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Might, might, might I have a word? Yeah, please, go on. Mm, yes, um, hello. Uh, I am Dr. Benjamin Peabody, uh, the coroner. Oh. Wallace Phillips was a friend of mine. I see. Uh, condolences. Yes. You were also friends of his? Yes. Then yeah. I also extend condolences to you. Um, as mentioned, I am the coroner, and, um, well, let us say the results of the autopsy are still pending, but um, there were certainly irregularities. Um, I read your account that you uh, gave to the authorities. Um, yes. Most shocking. I'm sorry you had to witness something like that. Um, I thought you should have these. He gives you an envelope. Glancing inside, you recognize some of Wallace's papers. And I will turn these over to you now. He also gives you a small box. Um, we retrieved this specimen in the uh, course of our examination of uh, the cadaver. Um, Inside of it? Uh, well, in the throat. Uh, as per your account, the... Uh, yes. Well, yes, I, I shouldn't really speak here, but I would like to speak to all of you at my office later this afternoon. Of course. Yeah. And I understand you were helping Wallace? Yes. Then uh, perhaps you can what? help me as well. Um, a friend of mine, uh, a long time acquaintance, uh, Professor Millicent Hunt at the uh, Miskatonic University. She, uh, well, I could use her opinion on the specimen I collected. Uh, it's uh, in the box. Do I know that name, Millicent Hunt? Hmm. How familiar are you with Miskatonic University? Uh, I would probably know a little bit, being that my son likely wanted to attend. Give me a luck roll. Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you were from just outside Arkham in the countryside, and that's yes. where your boarding house is, yes? Yes. Okay, yeah, I can see. Success. Great. You have heard of Professor Millicent Hunt. She's a lepidopterist. Oh, a what, what? Lepidopterist. Uh, people who study moths and butterflies. Ah, uh, that's, that was my guess. Mm. What, what, uh, <laughs> no, I had no idea. And as a matter of fact, uh, she often has excursions to the countryside, uh, as one might expect of someone who studies uh, fauna. She may have even stayed at your place once. I think with a successful luck roll, yes, we can say, we can say that. You're, you do recall that name from the register. Okay, do I know her kind of general demeanor then? Like, do I remember, like, was she sweet? Was she? Yeah, she seemed quite nice, uh, very neat and tidy. Uh, came Love that. with a couple of nets and some jars and left with them filled with butterflies. Oh. I, I know Millicent uh, vaguely, but she's very sweet. Yes, um, if you could, uh, I, I understand she'll be available at uh, 1 p.m. today. S certainly. Uh, okay. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Uh, no. Well, yeah. I'll explain more when we meet later this afternoon. I would uh, say uh, three, three thirty, be uh, good for you. That sounds great because we we've seen a lot of weird things lately. Yes, so and whatever uh, we can. If, yes, whatever yes. help we can get. Any uh, insight that uh, Professor Hunt is able to provide would be much appreciated. 
One quick question before we part ways. Did you discover what the cause of death was? He looks around. We should speak at my office. Very well. Uh, good day to you. Good day. Good day. And he bustles off. So, Dr. Peabody has left you with what appear to be some case files that Wallace was working on. You also, if you look in the box, find a familiar moth, a specimen of one of the moths that flew out of Wallace's gaping mouth in the apartment that night. Speaking of the apartment itself, it's actually been left to Theodore oh. in Wallace's will. He owned the apartment, and you can use it as a base of operations if you like. I suggest we head back there for now before we start tending to the appointments that we need to go. What time is it right now? Uh, it is getting close to one. Close to one? But it might be good to gather your wits at the yeah. apartment. As you go over the information that you've gathered, uh, these case files, and of course you also have an address to a certain house. Mm -hmm. Yes. 603 Derby Street, the location where you dropped the body of Carl Lund. Oh, maybe we go mm -hmm. back, freshen up, and we could drive by the house just to see what it looks like in the daytime. Or who it belongs to. Yes, I'd, I'd like to take a look at these case files as well that, that Wallace was working on. Yeah. Getting back to the privacy of the apartment, you open the files, and there are two in particular that stand out. Do you want to take one? I'll take the other. Certainly. You're a doctor, so. One is, I believe, case, case file number 196. You have 196. I have 186. Oh, I'm sorry, 186 and 93. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 186 is, I believe, familiar to you, for it is, in fact, the case that Wallace was working on at the time of his death, the missing persons case of Anna Lund. Would you like to tackle that one first? Case notes number 186, September 16th, 1928. Received anonymous note in mailbox, mailbox attached four days ago. Preliminary inquiries gathered from family slash acquaintances. Anna Lund, 24 years old, Swedish immigrant, English, reasonable, not fluent. Occasionally volunteered at soup kitchen. Had gained employment with Holbrook family as maid. Seen with young man, question mark, romance, question mark. Brother Carl involved in something, bootleggers probably. That's not true. Carl Lund seen arguing with well-dressed young man, same young man as seen with Anna. Action, further look into Lund's activities. If am to proceed with further investigation in Rivertown, we'll need help. Suspect this case, suspect this case will run deep into mob territory and health regrettably not what it was. The other case file seems to be from some years ago. Case notes, number 93, October 11th, 1923. Mrs. Nancy Holbrook thinks husband Jefferson involved in an affair with Miss Eleonora Birch. Leads minimal, Mrs. Holbrook basing assertion on observing secret meeting between Miss Birch and Mr. Holbrook. Miss Birch departing Holbrook residence by back door, Mr. Holbrook making no mention of her visit. Eleonora Birch, member of Daughters of Grace Charitable Organization. Work with poor, run soup kitchen in Rivertown, help young women obtain educational scholarships, and I guess probably also help young women in trouble, though likely do not advertise the fact. Jefferson Holbrook, recall from Christmas event last year. Tough nut, but struck me as a good family man. Affair seems out of character, but not impossible. Mrs. Holbrook distraught. October 19th, observed H's activities over the past week, established a regular routine, home, workplace, club, lunch, some evening visits, regular Sunday afternoons, confirmed by doorman Philip Ingalls. No real variance in activities. October 21st, Mary Prentice, 
Elizabeth Woodley, Daughters of Grace Soup Kitchen, laughed at notion of Miss Birch affair. She is too busy, inclined to believe this. Suggested H made donation to organization, aiming for discretion. We'll attempt to look into H accounts to confirm. October 30th, Mrs. Holbrook has called off investigation. Says was misunderstanding. Brought apple pie and had very sunny disposition. Must say she looked better. I happily put this one to bed. Oh, uh, that's how weird, weird right? Girls, right? <laughs> this is extremely suspicious. Uh, the daughters of Grace are clearly not what they seem. Um, I. Uh, I, this is some sort of leap of some in some way, but I would presume that something happened to Mrs. Holbrook. Um, yeah, because she seems very different from the start of that to the end of that. Nobody's just like, oh, you know what? Forget I said anything about my husband cheating on me, even though, come on. Oh, yes, yes. She's it's very unusual. Perfect, physically speaking. And now bakes apple pies, apparently. Something Something's strange, off. something unusual. We've already seen that. I mean, the strangeness that we experienced at the cemetery the other night. It's not based in our reality. It's not grounded. It's not logical. And, and neither, it seems, is, is she. I, I, I wonder if it is even Mrs. Holbrook we were speaking with. I don't know, but hear me out. Over at that soup kitchen, she told us, don't come here at night. And we saw some crazy things the other night at the graveyard. Yes. Maybe they're connected. I have to ask before we go any further, who's in? Because I have to tell all of you, once we start going down this rabbit hole, it's only going to get worse. We've scratched the surface of something, Vic, as you said, beyond us. Something that cannot be explained. Something evil. And I will tell you right now that whatever this is will make whatever those beasts in the cemetery look like seem like pleasant pets. At that mention, I want to look at the bat that I had used to bash in those those creatures. Is there anything strange about those nails? Anything unusual at all about the structure, the material? They seem to be nails pounded into a baseball bat to increase the damage that they do. Just normal nails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. No one here except for you, Theodore, is personally attached to this man. No one is required to move forward on this if they don't wish to. He was to. just doing his job. It's, it's... I want... I want to know what happened to Anna Lund. So long as we all know that we are risking perhaps worse than our very lives by doing this. It is always a risk. But in the meantime, her family waits with no answer as to what has happened to her, nor her brother. They must get closure of some kind. We owe them that, and we've been tasked to do so by Wallace, who now lays in the ground. We, it would be the very least we could do is to continue his search before any others are heard. And whatever happened to Wallace, people know now that we've been helping him out. So now we got targets on our backs, potentially. Yes, we ought to be quiet about that. So I feel like we don't have a choice whether we're in this or not. I told him I was going to find her. So that's what I intend to do. So all in then? Yeah, all in. All in. All right. Just so long as we know. Well, then, I believe we have an appointment that we have to keep, don't we? Maybe this doctor can tell us something about this moth you got. He's hoping. It's unusual. 
strangeness, everything happening. Ah, yes. Your appointment with Professor Hunt at Miskatonic University is at 1 p.m. You do have a little time before that occurs. And Vic, you particularly, given your occupation, know that there are certain reliable ways to find out who owns a given property, especially since you have the full address of the house where you dropped the body of Carl Lund. That was 603 East Derby Street. Mm -hmm. So likely sources of information for this would include the post office, uh, the local council, or landed property lawyers. And you've certainly used all three of those avenues when tracking down addresses before. Uh, do you want to follow up on any of those? Yes, and, and when I've gone to, say, the post office, is there a, an angle in which they've given the address, or do they just give it to anyone who asks? You might have to grease a few palms. Mm -hmm. uh, you can come up with right. a, you know, a convincing falsehood, if you like. All right. <clears throat> Shall we find out more about this uh, address? Who may who the owners may be. Yeah, since they got a whole cello to drop off dead people at. All right, let's go to the post office then. Start oh. there. That will actually be on the way to Miskatonic University, so you can easily do that uh, as you journey to meet Professor Hunt. When you arrive at the post office, what tack do you take? I will hand you any petty cash that I have on oh. me just to assist you with potentially in your endeavor if you choose to go that route. And each of you earned $40, or a, a total of, you all together earned a we total of $40, $40 plus, now. you know, right. Betty's winning. So you have mm -hmm. quite a bit of cash for 1928. Bucks. Nice. <laughs> I could know these people. Oh, by all means, if you know them, then if you can get information on the owners of that house. I can certainly try. So what will it be? Are we going to try bribery? Are we going to try a cover story? Are we just going to see if I perhaps we Theodora knows? start with a, do I know them? And then if things go really downhill, <laughs> I have $10. <laughs> <laughs> plan B. Very well. Uh, give, I'll give me luck again. Sure, why not? George Washington. <laughs> Hard Maybe success. Maybe two George Washingtons. Ooh. <laughs> Hmm? Hard success. Ah, as a matter of fact, the young clerk working at the post office when you enter is known to you. You have a very popular uh, uh, <laughs> accommodation in the countryside. <laughs> uh, he looks up and is like, oh, it's you. This is a young fellow by the name of Peter Simpson. Peter Simpson. Simpson. Um, hello. Oh. Um, what, 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 are you, what are you doing here? Hi, Peter. Oh, How are you? I, 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 I do remember staying. I'm, I'm sorry, I forget your name. It's okay. It's Theodore. Theodore. Yeah. How could I forget? <laughs> yes. Nice to hello. see you again. Very, very nice to see you. So, uh, what, um, are, what can I help you with? I just recently, um, I was donating some clothes to a, a local house here mm -hmm. um, and we were exchanging back and forth and I unfortunately think that I gave them a piece of Theo's clothing that I didn't want to give away. Oh, um, oh I'm so sorry. And uh, I didn't catch their name or their contact but I do have their address. Would it be possible for you to tell me who they are? Um, he looks around. Uh, I'm sure that's fine. Um, do you have, are you trying a persuade or charm or, I would say. I'm trying to charm, I think. A yeah, bit. I would say charm. Okay. Success. Well, uh, I, I don't see what it could hurt. Um, yes, if you can give me the address, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I should be able to look that information up. I might have to do it on, on uh, my break, but um, yes. Um, yeah, I, should I contact you at? Uh, do you you know uh, Wallace Phillips's address? Wallace Phillips. I'll give you that address as oh, well. Of course. Um, but the address that I'm looking for is uh, 603 East Derby Street. He writes it down. 603 East Derby Street. Shouldn't be too much trouble. Perfect. You are such a sweet young boy. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, go on. 
Well, thank you. Okay. And next time you come up, I'll have to make those strudels that you like so much. Those were very good strudels. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you. Yeah, next to and uh, your and friends as well. And when can I expect that? He sort that? of, as he as his eyes glide across and sees Betty, he's like, oh, oh, just seems startled for a moment, and then looks up and <laughs> sees you. He's like, oh, uh, hello, hello, uh, hello. Uh, yes. Well, um, all the best. I'll, I'll I'll be in touch. Okay, perfect. And uh, you give him yes. Wallace's address as well, the Terrace yes. Building Apartments. Uh, yeah. Simpson, is are you related to Miss Mary Simpson? Mary Simpson? You know, I had an Aunt Mary, but she lived in Duluth. Just curious. Mm. Good day. There's lots of Simpsons. <laughs> um, I take a look because I hear her say, it's a piece of Theo's clothing. Um, is she wearing a wedding ring? I, yeah, Theodore would be wearing a wedding ring. Uh, Theodore, are you married? It's a very forward question. I'm not, it's not a proposition, it's... I'm not oh, okay, it. wow, my mind went somewhere else. <laughs> uh, no, I am not currently. Uh, um, if you don't mind me asking, who's Theo then? Uh, he's my son. You have a son? I had a son. Um, but I do have, I have a son, yes. He passed a couple of years ago. I understand, I'm, I apologize. It's, it's passed. Um, I did actually donate some clothing of his though that I didn't have any use for anymore, and there were a couple of pieces I wish I hadn't have given away, but. Uh, oh, geez, I'm sorry, Theodore. You want us to go break into the house too? <laughs> no, it's all right. It was a long time ago. Um, but Wallace was like, he wasn't the father by any means, but he was very close to Theo, so. I see. It's really a shame. I agree. You've been having this conversation as you walk towards the campus of Miskatonic University. Perhaps what Arkham is best known for, one of the preeminent learning institutions of the United States of America at this time, well known for its medical sciences, and its library, in particular, is renowned. Uh, the lepidopterist you have an appointment with, Professor Mill Millicent Hunt, is at the School of Natural Sciences building, according to the information you were given by Dr. Peabody. And at the appointed time, you find yourself standing outside of her office. When you knock at the door, uh, it is answered by a tall, thin woman with gray hair, which she has tried and failed to contain in a bun. Uh, she seems quite excited and quite fervent about her, see her field of study, uh, as you can tell by the generously sized office with large windows, wall-to-ceiling bookcases, and wall space covered in framed paintings and photographs, mainly exact biological paintings of moths and butterflies. Uh, there is also a large photograph uh, and an equally large plaque indicating that it is Margaret Fontaine, a pioneer British lepidopterist who is standing in a butterfly house, a Victorian glass and steel greenhouse, wearing a long baggy canvas coat with butterflies and moths fluttering all around her. <laughs> Dr. Hunt is pleased to see all of you. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Peabody said that you would be coming. Uh, please come in, come in. Uh, I'm Millicent Hunt, uh, professor here at uh, Miskatonic, as you might guess by my office being on campus. Uh, yes, good to see you all. So, uh, what do you have for me? Uh, well, professor, um, we were given uh, this rather strange specimen found recently, and we were hoping you could give uh, some information on it. Pass over the box and open the lid. My. Very interesting. I, I've never seen a moth quite like this. It flew out of a dead friend's mouth. What's that? 
Um, it, um, it, we found it, um, upon finding out, friend. Oh. Flew out, yes, and with, others like it flew out of its, his body. I, this was found in the throat. I, but it's highly unusual. I, I, even without this rather colorful story, I've, I've never seen a moth like quite like this. It's certainly not an indigenous species. I suppose it could have been specifically bred by someone, but it, it's definitely not from around here. Um, um, why don't you come over here? She has a desk set up for the dissection of Lepidoptera. There's a bright electric lamp, a small selection of scalpel knives and tweezers, and a mounted magnifying glass. She expertly pins the moth onto the dissection board and begins her work. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah there are some very, very unusual characteristics. Um, she moves her glasses down her nose. Such as? Uh, well, for starters, I mean, the wing venation is very primitive, and uh, well, the mouth parts are extraordinary. In addition to a proboscis, uh, as you'll see here, and she's sort of pointing with the tweezers and the big magnifying glass. Occasionally, she goes on the other side, and just you can see like a big eye. <laughs> uh, she, uh, uh, yes, um, in addition to a proboscis, uh, this moth, seems to have mandibles um, for, for chewing, not for sipping, as is most common. Um, this, I mean, I, I can't think of any other explanation that it's some sort of archaic species, uh, uh, perhaps a, even from a Lepidoptera long thought extinct. Uh, oh, hold on, she cuts it open, she, Again, begin just lots of muttering and like, oh, oh my, oh, really? Well, uh, and she turns to you to explain. Now, this moth is technically female, but lacks the full reproductive tract. And if I had to guess, I would say that it reproduces asexually, uh, perhaps even like a parasite, which, which is simply unheard of. <laughs> uh, though it's very odd. This does bear a similarity to an illustration I saw in a book here at Arkham, uh, at the Arkham Athenaeum Club on Kerwin Street. Uh, I haven't looked at it in quite some time. It, I thought it quite fanciful at the time, but now seeing the, well, the biological proof of it before my eyes, I'm, I think I should have to look at that again. <laughs> Do you remember what book it was? Uh, it was at the Athenaeum, I, I recall. Uh, I'm afraid uh, the title escapes me, but uh, they they scrupulously maintain their collection there. I'm, I'm sure someone would be able to help you. Uh, and the library is uh, open to the public, as uh, far as I recall. Uh, I'm not a member myself, but, uh, well, the Athenaeum Club, they certainly do the Lord's work in terms of preserving knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, do remember the unusual mandible proboscis arrangement. That's what uh, twigged it in my mind. Uh, uh, the Arkham Athenaeum Club should still have the book. They, they do tend to hang on to things. Uh, it would be a treasure trove of information. Uh, the men of the AAC are not serious scientists, mind you. Uh, just very wealthy men with the time and funds to explore their passions without concern or consequence. Uh, uh, Perhaps I should be less critical. Uh, they have been very generous to the natural sciences department and, and to the medical school here at Miskatonic. Uh, which uh, wealthy men in particular have been generous? Who are some of your highest donors? Oh, uh, well, the Athenaeum Club in general, but uh, many prominent citizens. Uh, 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 Mr. Holbrook, for example. Uh, he's often uh, the spokesman for the group. He's quite odd, though, isn't he? Mr. Holbrook? Oh, uh, cuts quite a dashing figure, if I were 30 years younger. <laughs> Have you met I'm him? joking, of course. I'm, I, I don't mean any impropriety. Have you met his wife? Oh, yes, quite a beauty, isn't she? Is Have you ever known her beforehand? 
Hmm? Uh, how long have you known Miss Nancy? Oh, not that long at all. Uh, I think within oh, the last uh, four or five years. And you haven't noticed any changes from her? Oh, I, I don't know her well. <laughs> but again, she does make an impression. <laughs> of course, she's always made this impression. Oh, Good. certainly on me. <laughs> Understood. They don't have any children, do they? Oh, uh, yes, uh, they do have a boy, um, uh, Cyrus. Cyrus, uh, Cyrus. can you tell him? Why, he's, he's probably uh, university age now, now that I think of it. Uh, but, uh, hmm. Is he quite dashing? Oh, uh, I seem to recall. I, I think I saw him, oh, it was a few years ago. I think he was uh, still uh, in high school at the time. But, uh, oh, who knows, we'll be seeing him around campus in short order. Not that a uh, young man of his means would uh, necessarily attend university. <laughs> yes. He's not a student currently, though. Mm, no, I don't believe so. I see. Hmm. Um, so, uh, all of these findings with this specimen, this moth, um, you think it is archaic in nature? Yes, as I say, uh, possibly from an extinct species. And, and to uh, go the, back... the, the, the arrangement, the proboscis and mandibles, you know, of course, uh, moths usually uh, uh, sup upon nectar and that sort of thing, to, to find uh, no, I am concerned, too. you said it's parasitic. This, this specimen was found within the throat of a body, but before that... Throat um, of a body? Hundreds of... Other specimens flew out of the mouth. That is, it certainly flies in the face of anything I know of Lepidoptera, and I have studied them for some time, but still, the, the proof is before you. Here, again, the, the reproductive tract is not complete, and yes, asexual reproduction does seem to be what's being pointed to here. Yes. And so you're suggesting that those were, those were uh, it's children, and it's, uh, those are more offspring? And will they his, do the same? Out of his throat, you say? Yes. Yeah. I've never heard the like. Please do let me know uh, if you manage to locate this book. I, I, I should like to look at it again uh, with this information. Would you mind if I kept this specimen? I don't believe there should be a problem with that. So. We won't yes, need I, it to reference at the. <laughs> well, if anything, it would be safe here, right? Oh, it's certainly. I'll consider it uh, your property that I'm uh, merely uh, caretaking, and uh, you we... don't mind if I were to. Uh, well, I think I could write several papers on this. Could we please ask you, though, for the time being, to keep this between us? Oh. Yes, oh, no, no, I, uh, well, in academia, one does not wish to um, trumpet one's findings before one is ready to publish, so, yes. Excellent. I would like to do a quick psychology check on this woman to see if she's being sincere. Sure, think. Give mm -hmm. it to you. That's what she, okay, I did do it, and it was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> she seems very excited about this. Would yeah. this specimen still lay eggs, even though it produces asexually? Mm, no, that's the thing. It's, its reproductive tract is not complete. It would be incapable of producing the eggs. Um, never seen the like of this. My, my, my. Huh. She sort of turns back. She was absentmindedly, is like turning back. She's still sort of dissecting it. Question for the, for the keeper. Mm -hmm. uh, upon closer look now that we have this box with this moth, is this the same moth that we're seeing tattooed on people's hands? Mm. You didn't get that close a look at the tattoos, but it's certainly similar. The pattern seen, she spoke about the odd venation in the wings. It could be. Maybe we get a closer look. Yeah, it can't be just a coincidence. I will say, I, I think you can keep it and we'll look into the other book if we can find it. Of course, yes, I would appreciate uh, being updated on uh, any findings. Yes, we will let you know. Yes. Thank you for your assistance in this. Oh, of course. Uh, thank you. Thank all of you. Bye. Fascinating. Wow, you could be the next Margaret Fontaine. Oh, oh, oh well, <laughs> I, certainly, I, I wouldn't complain. <laughs> yeah, so just take care of it, please. Hmm. Thank you for your time, by the way. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank most you. welcome. <laughs> and she happily uh, returns to the dissection as you leave. All right, uh, 
we're all concerned about there being a son, Cyrus Holbrook. Yes. It's yeah. got to be a, a, a rich, handsome young man, yes, and those two are real with. handsome. Yes, yes. Does seem to be pointing in that direction. And and the the daughters of Grace is is becoming more and more. They're connected with all of these people, mm -hmm. and then this this club. It's got to be the club that was mentioned in the case about this the guy going back and forth. Oh, oh, he wasn't having an affair because he kept going to this club. Yes. And then she mentioned that he was going to this uh, Ath Athenaeum club. Shall we go try and uh, procure this book then? Uh, we have an appointment to keep first. So, with your appointment with Dr. Peabody, the coroner, not set until 3.30, you'll have a little over two hours, and you realize that there's probably enough time to visit the Arkham Athenaeum Club. In search of this book, which Professor Hunt mentioned, the Arkham Athenaeum Club is housed within a gracious Georgian mansion on Kerwin Street in Arkham. It was, at one time in its history, a small hospital serving the well-to-do of Arkham during sickness and confinement. It's now been converted into a large gentleman's club. On the main floor, to the right-hand side of the marbled entrance hall, is a large wood-paneled drawing room with an array of comfortable chairs, low tables, and a well-stocked bar at the end. To the left of the hall is a library. Uh, according to some signage, non-members are permitted to look at books in the library, but not to remove them without permission from a member. And only guests of members may retire to the drawing room, or to any of the well-appointed bedrooms or studies upstairs. When you arrive, you are, of course, able to just go inside freely and see all of this. You do hear quiet murmurs and conversation from the drawing room, and the odd burst of gentlemanly laughter, which probably sounds like, oh, 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 oh. Uh, but no particular words can be made out. Along one side of the hall, there is a coat rack upon which the names of great philosophers are engraved. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. There are hooks for hats, and coats beneath each of these names, and a small cubbyhole, which might be for gloves or a hat, uh, perhaps a place to hang a walking stick. There is an old retainer sitting at a neat desk just inside the door. He looks up, and he's dressed in a formal uniform uh, with gold frogging at the shoulders, uh, which somewhat dwarfs his fragile form. He's quite advanced in years. His white hair is neatly combed, and his eyes are roomy and watery, but kind. Uh, yes, yes, uh, may I help you? We are students looking to uh, get some more research into the subject of lepidoptery. Lepidoptery? Lepidoptery? Oh, butterflies. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Question, how old are your investigators? <laughs> 28. 28? 39. 34. 35. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, students, you say? Yes, you can uh, achieve your education at any age, they say. Oh, uh, yes, very true, very true. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, please uh, uh, come in. Uh, I am uh, <clears throat> Philip Ingalls, uh, great pleasure. Uh, to welcome you to the Arkham Athenaeum Club. Uh, uh, you've uh, read the signage, yes. Uh, uh, you're, of course, uh, free to read the books in the library, but we ask that you, uh, uh, you leave them here. Only members are permitted to uh, sign them out. And, uh, of course, there are certain areas that are off limits unless you are accompanied by a member of the club. Of course. Yeah. Sure. How does one become a member of this fine establishment out oh, of curiosity? Oh, oh, the hazing rituals alone, I tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm joking, of course. I'm, I'm not permitted to discuss this. Uh, you would <laughs> need to be uh, inducted uh, by uh, a member, nominated for membership, and uh, there are uh, quite a number of, uh, as they say, trials uh, to go through. Yes. There, you see, I'm, uh, well, uh, he's Sort of, uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, you may not enter the drawing room unless you're signed in as a guest 
of a member, uh, and the, the rest of the house is also off limits to visitors. Uh, uh, but uh, do enjoy the library, and I, I wish you well in your education. Thank you. Thank you. He very slowly sits back down. Is he the only one tending to this space? Yeah, he seems to ease the doormat, and uh, as I mentioned, you can hear that there are other people the in the building. Room. Yeah. But uh, no one's in the hallway currently. Oh, this is just the hallway. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm really glad he was nice about that. I would have hated to punch him in the face. Oh. He God. does not look like he would have survived that. <laughs> <laughs> he is oh, very, God. very old. <laughs> to the library, then. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, there's very neat little brass plaques telling you uh, which way to go. The original drawing room of the house is what the library is. Uh, it's a large room with floor-to-ceiling shelves of warm oak built into the walls. Shorter bookcases throughout the length of the center of the room form low stacks. The large windows are shuttered, but there are reading lamps on several small tables distributed throughout the room. There is someone present in the library, a young woman who moves between the stacks, dusting the shelves and arranging books. And I think we can meet her now. The young woman smiles broadly upon seeing you, boldly marches over, moving through the space with confidence and ease. She introduces herself as Pippa Franklin. How do you do? I'm Pippa Franklin. Uh, can I help you with anything? I'm your gal. Anything you need to know, I can help you with right here in this library. Oh, uh, that's, that's great. That's great. Incredibly useful. Thank well, you. That's what I'm here to be, useful. Oh, I'm just glad someone came today. It's so boring here. Oh. Do you not get a lot of visitors? Because this place seems like a real nice joint. It's so nice, but have you seen the kind of people, the society people? I mean, they're all great. I guess I'm one of them, but it's a bit, you know, not a lot of fun. Wait, so, so when they come in, uh, they have your assistance, your raid, in finding whatever it is they're looking for? Oh, yes, uh, if they come in and they want any help, they ask me, I can help them find things. I mostly just dust and arrange and keep things, you know, spick and span and... But you see who comes in and out. Then. Well, if they come into the library. It's a strange question. <laughs> you uh, see everyone who comes through. We're a little bit curious. I mean, we're... We're newcomers to this establishment. There's such history behind it. So yes. forgive us for being a little overwhelmed. History. There is so much history in this building. Did you know behind this is one of the, what I think is one of the oldest buildings in Arkham? I oh. don't know. How old? Yes. Uh, quite old. Which building is that? Well, it used to be the old hospital. Oh. What kind of hospital was it? Well, I guess one where they did surgeries and things. <gasps> there is, now I haven't found it. I've done some exploring. I haven't found it yet. But somewhere in the old part of the building is actually an operating theater. Can you imagine sitting in seats, glancing down at a surgery while it's happening live in front of you? It's <laughs> bizarre. Fancy people like weird things. But can yeah. I help you with the books? Yes, yes, uh, uh, Yes, we're um, actually amateur lepidopterists ourselves, and we're hoping to look at books for about lepidoptery. Right, any. butterflies, of course, yes, everyone yes, yes, knows. Yes, yes, butterflies, mats, of course. <laughs> right. Yes. I am an a also an amateur leopardopterist. We're students at the university, you see. Yes, very much so. Um, oh. So... Can well, you assist? <laughs> you know, everyone deserves a second phase in life, right? And that's what I'm doing as well. You know, I used to be a journalist. <laughs> really? Um, natural science, yes, let me show you. Please. She guides you <laughs> to the natural science section. And after a bit of looking, does anyone have library use? Uh, probably not me, I <laughs> don't think so. Uh, it's Maybe. minimal. As it is probably going to be me and 50, though. Nope. Nope, nope. That's right. the, yeah, that's the best shot we got, yeah. probably. Yeah. Right. Right. Do it to it. You gotta like those odds. I don't, I don't read books. Success! Books. Success! Well done, Doctor. 
Dr. Desmond, after a bit of searching, uh, the rest of you sort of aimlessly stand around, look, you think they all look like books to you, but uh, Dr. Archibald Desmond uh, has some knowledge of the Dewey Decimal System. If in, if in fact that is in place yet, I'm not that sure. That is the beginning of a rap song. Yes. <laughs> uh, and he's been all in the library before, he went to med school. So, you do find a book called Lepidoptera of Essex County by Madeline Brigham. Um, do you know, has anyone else ever uh, looked at this book in particular? Oh, uh, not that I've noticed or could say. I'm sure some people have, but I can't remember anyone, no. Well, don't you got a checkout system if we were supposed to check out books? How well, would guests are free. Uh, excuse me, members, of course, are free to look at whatever they want and can give permission to someone to check a book out, but most people don't just come in off the street checking out books from this library. There is no ledger in place, should they do so? Uh, when you spoke to Mr. Ingalls, the uh, doorman, he did tell you that you were free to read books in the library. And here is the information you find in Lepidoptera of Essex County by Madeline Brigham. Here we are. I'll let you peruse that at your leisure. But with your successful library use role, I can also provide you with some bullet points mm -hmm. of information. The drawing is indeed very similar mm -hmm. to the moth that you gave to Professor Hunt. Notes include that this species was only seen once in this region. In 1705, before a brief but terrible epidemic. More details about this epidemic can be found in History of Disease in Arkham by Dr. Darwin Hawthorne. The author has no idea where this species came from, uh, postulating that it's an ancient, possibly extinct species, and certainly not native to this area. And, much like Professor Hunt, points out that the mouth parts of this moth are particularly unusual in that they have mandibles as well as proboscis. I'm gonna go on that same library use role, especially if you were going through the card catalog and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the Athenaeum also has a copy of History of Disease in Arkham. And I actually have two copies of this. History of Disease in Arkham by Dr. Darwin Hawthorne. You have two copies to glance over at your leisure. But once again, that successful library use role, I will give you some bullet points. So, the pertinent information that you glean from History of Disease in Arkham is that in 1705, a terrible outbreak known as the Pestilence wiped out over half of Arkham's population. It seems to have been some sort of flesh-eating bacteria, accompanied by high fever and delirium. Hallucinations were reported amongst the survivors. It had rapid onset and rapid mortality. Uh, one Alfred Pill, who was Arkham's first physician, lost a leg, a hand, and a portion of his colon to this disease. Oof. A plague of moths pre uh, preceded the outbreak, though the moths are unlikely to have caused it since Lepidoptera do not carry diseases. No one knows what the source of the infection was, and it is impossible for, it was impossible rather, for the author to do further research, as the location of the graveyard in which the bodies were buried is unknown and was thought to be deliberately hidden. It's referred to as the pestilence graveyard or the plague graveyard. Uh, did you uh, discover anything interesting? Um, I relay all that information to the rest of you. Mm -hmm. In your study of butterflies and looking up books on butterflies, you find another book. A Modern Woman's Guide to Myth and Legend <laughs> by Abigail Trout. And she specifically, in one of her books, in, or rather in this particular book, has a chapter on butterflies. And here we are. <laughs> so, 
so many books. This book in particular is written in a rather engaging and eccentric style. Uh, the author uh, is fond of jokes and has a rather witty sense about her. The bullet points that you gather from this are that there are not many butterfly gods, which the author finds quite surprising given the fact that butterflies are fanciful and would, you know, religious experience and mysticism, one would think that there would be more, but one of the exceptions is the Aztec death goddess, It's Papalotl, also known as the clawed butterfly. It's Papalotl was a defender of women, ruled a place in the afterlife for midwives. The mother. Mm. Also was the patron of women who died in childbirth and infants, and had an army of skeleton women called the Tsitsi Mittel. Ms. Trout discovered an odd fragment while researching its papalotl. The translation was, and the idiots called the scourge moth, thinking it was the butterfly. You might notice that this whole time Pippa is like kind of just hovering yeah. <laughs> around, like not too obtrusively, but she's just kind of like, I want to be a part. Yeah. Don't mind me. <laughs> In fact, Pippa can, I think, perhaps just chat to them I mean, almost <laughs> incessantly while they're <coughs> busily trying to absorb all this stuff. So what would Pippa be saying during all of this? Probably oh. just telling her, telling them about herself or? <laughs> oh, uh, butterflies and then oh, disease and then, oh, that is a good one. Abigail Trout, she is a hoot. You should read her work. She has so many jokes in there and you're trying to read. I know I'm so sorry, it's just so, Boring in here, and... Uh, have you read just, many of these? No. No? No, I, I keep them clean, and there's so many books in here. It's so... Of course. So many to get through. But I am working my way slowly. Okay. Yes. Something has to be done to pass the time. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, women of high society such as yourself, I mean, do, have, are you also part of do the I... Daughters of Grace? I wish. Aren't they lovely? They do so much good work. Do I, I look like I'm a society woman? Oh, I, yeah. To I me, just, I'm, thank look at you. Me. I look at myself in the mirror every morning. And I say, you've done it. You've done it, Pippa. Today, they're going to recognize you. They are going to let you into their little clique. But you know what they haven't? Think six months of being married to George and they would have accepted me into their little group. But I mean, I'm likable, right? Totally. Everyone's always liked me. I've always had lots of friends and these women, excuse me, around, make sure no one's walked in, but uh, they just won't let me in. They don't, ex they don't invite me to things. They don't, I, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing wrong, but maybe it's because I had a job before. Do I you think that's it? I think that you are an individual and that you are better off for that. Oh. You shine well, all you. on your own. <laughs> well, thank you. They're bore anyway, did you know? that some of them are away right now. Cyrus Holbrook is getting married and his fiance and some of these other women are away right now for a fiance's retreat. Wait, who is he marrying? If you oh, I, I don't know. Like I said, they don't tell me anything. They don't talk to me. They barely act like I exist. Do you know where this uh, retreat oh, is happening? It's quite a mystery. That's the most interesting part about it, is I don't know where it is. And George thought I should go, but I thought, oh, it sounds so boring. But you know, I think he might be trying to surprise me by a trip there. Because I keep going to my appointments and saying, oh, I'll see you next week when I get my hair set again. And they keep saying things like, oh, no, George canceled all of that. You must be going on a trip. I think maybe he's going to send me. Which I suppose he thinks is a nice thing to do. I'll have to deal with it. I'm um, sure I can make it fun. I'm sorry, who is your husband? Uh, George, George Franklin. Is he a part of this club that we're in? Yes, yes, mm-hmm. Ah. That's how I got this position. Again, it's the you... only thing that 
is deemed worthy for me now, I suppose. You've been married six months. Six months. How long did you know him before that? Oh, it was so romantic. So, some would say too soon, but I would say, you know, you're closing in on 30. You're not getting any younger. It's time to, to let whatever comes at you in life, just grab it by the horns, you know? Your husband sounds like quite the romantic. What, what does he yes. do for a living, exactly? He doesn't do anything for a living. Oh. <laughs> That's what makes a society. Ah, of course. I'm so confused by how all these rich people don't work. <laughs> I think it's some um, old family money, investments, probably rentals, I don't know. And certainly, did you have your own before meeting him? My own money? Yes. Well, I worked as a journalist for the Arkham Gazette, which I loved. But to be married to George, someone of his stature, you have to give up certain things. And that was one of the things I had to give up. But it's worth it for love. <laughs> Is it? You don't seem too happy about that. What do you mean? I'm smiling and laughing a lot, aren't I? <laughs> yes, yeah. you are. Yeah. Your husband has an estate, then? Y yes. Large estate about town, then, right? Well, sure, they all do. I haven't seen very many of the other ones, though, of course. Like I said, they, they haven't invited me around. But I do think that will change. I, I, I don't know how to convey this to you without it seeming out of nowhere or strange or... Well, just say it. Uh, well, there are some very odd things happening, and I think you ought to not go on this retreat. Well, I don't really want to go either. It sounds so boring. I'm just oh. going to sit around learning how to hold a teacup and cross right. my feet at the ankles when exactly. I sit down in a chair. Yes, it's, it's a, a waste of your time entirely. Yes, but again, sometimes there are sacrifices that must be made. Some sacrifices are too large, we might say. Just going on a trip. I, it's interesting. You are such a charming young woman. Oh. And being here with you has been such a hoot, just spending time with you. If we were to, say, call upon you as friends in some way, shape, or form, where would we meet you? You can always find me here. But outside of here, in a yeah. more relaxed setting. Yeah, I'm sure you don't want to spend all your time here. I know some things may need to be cleared with Franklin, and I understand that, but we can talk to him as well. It's just, you're this vivacious energy about you. It's Thank you. I have always thought that about myself. I'm starting to doubt. <laughs> well, I'm sure we can make something happen. You could just call upon the Franklin residence and I'm sure we can set something up. Maybe we could have a, a drink or something. You know what, we may do that in the future, I think. Actually, <laughs> if you know, I know I've been taking up so much of your time and just talk, talk, talking about myself. <laughs> um, I couldn't help but notice you were looking at books and talking about the pestilence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you know anything about it? Did you ever? Well, you know, journalist at heart, I can't help but investigate things. And since we're friends now, would you like me to show you something? Yes. Okay, it means we have to go somewhere we're not strictly allowed, okay? But, you know. <laughs> what are they going to do? Like, hang us as witches for being somewhere we're not supposed to be? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, come with me. There's a room right. full of old junk. But some of it's quite interesting. A cabinet of curiosities, almost. Um, but again, we'll, we'll have to be quiet. We're going into an area we're not strictly allowed. It'll be very quiet. Charming as this woman is, I would like to make a psychology check. <laughs> 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 you sung it. And what is the result? It is a supreme failure. I rolled a hundred. <gasps> oh, fumble? Yeah. I'm not sure if you can trust this woman. <laughs> Maybe she's gonna try to sell you something. <laughs> I will say also, just before you started this conversation, there was something in Abigail Trout's book, Modern Woman's Guide to Myth and Legend that struck your eye, and there is an addendum called Cuckoo Gods. 
But if you wanted to, you could maybe slip the book into your coat and read it later. I don't know if I can do that. Um, I could try, perhaps. Am I the only one who has an opportunity to do this? You were the one uh, examining it. Yeah, but Fair you can enough. hand it to anyone else to mm-hmm. look at. Good. Yeah, and then continue engaging somebody in conversation. <laughs> Cause a distraction. You <laughs> like, won't stop talking, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone ever told you that you bear a striking resemblance to a starlet in Hollywood? Which one? Who was it? It was this red-haired woman who was just coming up in the ages. She had this bright beaming smile and this amazing, just, just very well-defined chin. When you looked in her eyes, you swore you trusted everything she said, even though it went against everything you might believe in, against everything deep within you. You trusted this woman, no matter what. I think her name was Audrey Mason or something of the uh, like. <laughs> yes. No one has ever actually compared me to her before, but that's very kind. Um, mm. And you don't have to try so hard. I'm, I'm excited that you're here. It's nice to have nice people to talk to. You don't have to flatter me so much. It's all I'm, right. I'm sorry, I'm very awkward. That's okay. <laughs> so Pippa has offered to take you to this museum of curiosities you... and to lead the I'm way. I'm leaving the book there, and I was trying to use that as a distraction. Pippa turns around to lead you to what, and so she's the only one in the room, and she's not looking yeah. at you. The book is sitting there. I can try and take it if if I'm noticing that he's like trying to. Yeah, do we notice? That yeah, he's can, I, can we doing... like. Yeah, give me a spot yeah, hidden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Give me a spot hidden, give okay. me a spell. Success. On both? On spot hidden. And right. then what was the second? Stealth. Stealth. So if I got a hard success on a spot hidden, can I just assist in the distraction? Yes, I'll give you a bonus die on that. So basically. Okay. You can roll a d10 wild, and you can replace the tens value if it's better. Oh, nice. Success on stealth. Right. You have this book in your possession. As Pippa leads you through the door at the other end of the library, which opens up into a wide corridor. Across the corridor from you is a double door, and Pippa indicates that that's the place that you're not allowed back in. The thing that she mentioned earlier, the operating theater. And quiet. Yes. the architecture here is somewhat different. The corridors are narrower, the windows smaller. There's a much older feel to this part of the building. She leads you into a large circular room with no windows, where there are many shelves and display cases around the walls, all filled with archaic medical equipment, such as trepanning and bloodletting tools. There are whole sections dedicated to particular outbreaks of diseases or disaster in Arkham. Not just medical equipment, but memorial plaques, religious artifacts, that sort of thing. And perhaps the most prominent is what is labeled the pestilence display. Within the glass case is a plague doctor mask and cane. An original lithograph of the Daughters of Grace tending the sick. People in beds crying out as nurses walk between rows carrying lamps or crouch beside the dying with damp cloths and buckets. There's another lithograph of several young women, presumably the Daughters of Grace, supporting the sick as they walk towards an angel, colossal, beautiful, arms outstretched, towering over Arkham. Nine cherubim filled the sky around her. There is also a pendant, which according to the label is a pendant of St. Aloysius, an illuminated manuscript describing how the pestilence came unto the people and an angel rose over Arkham to save them, rather religious and opaque. This illuminated manuscript reads, And the pestilence did descend upon the people of Arkham, and their bodies were consumed by sin. But then it was that the good daughters did raise up their hands in prayer and call upon St. Aloysius in his grace, And thus did an angel rise over Arkham to welcome home those poor, tortured souls with forgiveness and with love. And here you may see. So in the style of an illuminated manuscript, 
Though if this is from 1705, it's clearly done as an imitation of a medieval illuminated manuscript. Do we know anything about St. Aloysius? What is he the saint of? I don't think you've asked anyone yet, but if anyone has any particular religious skill or... In fact, hmm, yes. Here on the plaque, there is also the uh, pendant of St. Aloysius. It indicates that St. Aloysius is the patron saint of plague victims, those who are afflicted by disease. I told you this stuff was great. <laughs> it is. It's strange, though, the Daughters of Grace, they go back so far in history here. Yeah. Oh, yes. A truly just admirable organization, don't you think? Um, they're certainly there when disaster strikes. Helping? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, if, in your years that you've been writing for the paper... Oh, yes. I mean, this with this pestilence that happened way long time ago, mm -hmm. it strikes me as really weird that there's this organization that's still like really hell-bent on like pre preserving the memory of St. Aloysius. And not to, not don't get me wrong, like doing charitable works is great and all, but like they seem really fixated on this one thing. And so I was wondering if you ever saw or read about anything kind of weird that's been happening in this town in regards to something similar to this, because this is just kind of very specific. Oh, there's plenty of weird things that happen here in this town, but I mean, I've done stories on the Daughters of Grace, but they've always, it's just a, uh, as far as I've been able to tell, an organization that rose up in a time of need and has continued trying to provide for those in need. Nothing that I've ever found working for the paper that would make them seem like they have ulterior motives or or anything like that. I I think they are just a really helpful, caring organization. You know, they help girls who get into trouble. What kind of trouble? And where do those girls no. go? Well, I don't think they go anywhere. They help it's not really help them a topic now. that we it's an impolite company when... Well, if you find I'm... out that you're having a baby. Yes. You know trouble. That and they trouble. Them. How? Did you know? The providing, getting them out of the sticky situation. Right, that's still very vague. You, we all, we're all adults here. I think we know what I'm talking well, what about. What, do they leave town? Like, there's many ways that you could help. Well, I don't know. I'm not a daughter of grace, and I've never been in that situation myself, but everything I've ever been told is it's admirable. What, I, what is all of this about? I would like to do some sort of search or spy head and check to know if this place has been used recently. Mm. Sure, give it to me. Success. This place has been maintained. There's certainly no layer of dust on things. So you're not sure if that necessarily means it's been used, it's just regularly cleaned. Hmm. Pippa, if I might. Of course. Do you have any thoughts on um, one Eleanor Birch? Just a general opinion. Uh, she runs the Daughters of Grace. I've, I've not, um, I don't really know much about her other than the respect I have for someone who runs such an organization. Hmm. Seems much more welcoming than the organization I'm a part of, let me tell you. Sometimes I think I should have tried to join the Daughters of Grace instead of marrying into all of this, but here we are. Indeed. What kind of uh, work did you do as a journalist? You know, the kind of stories that they give them. Woman had the paper, just um, stories about the char charitable works and, right. you know, openings and, you know, Things of that nature. I see. Do you um, find it interesting in one of the books that you gave us, mm -hmm. uh, there were these moths that were seen right before the pestilence? Why don't we discuss this back in the library? Oh. The longer we're here, the more likely we might get caught. I agree, and we don't want to get you in trouble. Thank Certainly. you, and I don't want to get you all in trouble. 
Can I take a look at the shelves and things that are here? Is there any signs of moths or like specifically the design that we've seen that moth? No, there are, uh, of course, references to the pestilence, and you do know that yeah. apparently these moths showed up during the pestilence, but not specifically in this display. In here, yeah. okay. The things I described, the plague doctor mask, mm -hmm. the, uh, things like that. As you re-enter the library, you see Nancy Holbrook and another woman do standing this. in the middle of the room, smiling at you as you enter. Did they see us come from the other room? They saw, they, they you know, I mean, there's a hallway, so they know you were in that hallway. Hello. Hello, Pippa. Hello. Hmm. Mrs. Holbrook. Were you exploring, Mrs. Franklin? Oh. You know that's not allowed. Well, <laughs> I twisted her arm about it. Is that true, Mrs. Franklin? Was your arm twisted? Well, one can't always resist the lure of investigation, can they? But we didn't touch anything, we didn't break anything, you know. I won't tell anyone if you won't. <laughs> Both of the women <clears throat> never stop smiling. My lips are sealed. We're just here to meet our husbands and I think I hear them now. And yes, you can hear some masculine voices moving down from the drawing room out into the echoing hall. They both turn to you, the rest of you. Oh, well, where are my manners? This is my friend, Mrs. Tillingast. Mrs. Tillingast smiles. Hello. Very nice to meet you all. Are you acquainted with these folk, Mrs. Hollenbrook? Yes. Yes, we met at a funeral. We heard there was a celebration coming soon. Oh, yes, there's always festivities. Nice to see you all again. As they turn to leave, they turn back at the door and speak to Pippa. I do hope you'll join us for tea one of these days, Mrs. Franklin. Of course, <laughs> I'd be happy to. And again, never stopping smiling, they both nod and leave. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> They've never invited me for tea before. <laughs> you know, you don't have to do any of this. <laughs> well, I want to make George happy. Do and you? This is yes. Of Why? course I do. Well, you don't. Why does it matter to you? I don't know, it sounds like you barely know the men. <laughs> it was me? I thank you for visiting, and I do hope to see you all again. Um, <clears throat> of course. But I think I must go back to my tidying up in here. Uh, it sure has been nice to have a respite from the dreary boredom of the day. Uh, Miss, do Miss, be careful. Miss Pippa, if I might. Yes. I am likely, you can tell, the oldest woman here. And I have some experience with trying to please men in my life and make them happy. And I had a son once, and I lost him because of that. So from one woman to another, Although I am not a daughter of grace, I am a woman of honesty. And I think that you should maybe pursue hobbies that are your own and that you enjoy. You are a very bright light in this world. And if you ever need a place of respite that is not involved with all of these high society folk, I have a little B&B &B on the outskirts of Arkham you're always welcome at. And I will treat you to tea for free and you can tell me every story you have ever wanted to chase. Well, thank you. That's very kind, and I apologize for losing my temper a moment ago. I look forward to seeing you all again. Yes, we look forward to seeing you again, and yes. we will. Of course, call any time. And with that, you exit 
the Athenaeum, passing by the old retainer. He's like, oh, thank you for coming. Good, good to see you. He's just polishing those the philosopher nameplates uh, with Hello, some wood polish. He's like, ooh, <laughs> my <laughs> question. Yes. Uh, did someone steal the book? I have it. Yes. Okay, cool. As you make your way in the taxi to Dr. Peabody's office at the city morgue on East Armitage Street, you return to the recently liberated book, Modern Woman's Guide to Myth and Legend by Abigail Trout, and the passage which caught your eye. I must make a small diversion here to include an interesting little thread that I discovered whilst digging into the arcana of the Aztec butterfly goddess, It's Papalotl. Amidst some old fragments was this particular gem. There's something in a language you can't read. Underneath it says, which according to my excellent translator, reads as, and the idiots called the scourge moth and walked into its arms, thinking it was the butterfly. The idea that something vile could trick a populace into doing something downright foolish by pretending to be something nice isn't an unfamiliar notion. Uh, the Christians are always banging on about how the devil does it. However, I thought I'd dig a little further, just for a lark. There wasn't quite enough for a full chapter at the time of printing, but I have included my few findings in a little addendum at the back of this book for anyone who's interested. Flipping to the back of the book, you find an addendum titled Cuckoo Guards. This note is really a bit of a wheeze on my part, as it's a notion that popped into my head whilst looking into the portrayal of butterflies in mythology. If you've read that chapter, you may have an inkling of where I'm going with this. Uh, to briefly recapitulate, whilst looking into the magnificent Aztec death goddess, its papalotl, I came across a fragment that seemed to imply that an imposter had at one point pretended to be its papalotl, presumably with odious intent. I cast around a bit to see if I could find examples of this sort of deific malfeasance elsewhere, and, with the help of a dear friend who's rather good on Mesopotamia, came across this morsel, something in Babylonian, which according to my Babylonian translator, excellent chap, this one reads, They thought they worshipped at the feet of Ishtar, but it was the hunger they called. Well now, what an interesting little nibble. I couldn't help but continue down the path, and after much hacking and slashing through the mythological weeds, found another nugget. This one amidst the Welsh cycle. Passage in Welsh, which translates rather ominously to, she called herself Branwyn, and we made her a feast. But she lied, and her name was Carnage. A further bit of intrigue to add is that around the time that all of these fragments are assumed to have been written, history notes that there were localized cataclysms that took out a proportionally whopping section of the population, largely due to plague and or famine. Those good old horsemen were highly active in the dangerous days of yore, and the dating of these fragments is really so speculative that it would be foolhardy to try to tie them conclusively to a specific event. However, I am fascinated by this idea of a cuckoo god, a being who slides into a culture by mimicking the qualities of an existing deity and siphoning off their worshippers for unknown nefarious purposes. It rather brings one's mind back to those naughty fairies of old European folklore, popping their changeling babies into the cots of the unsuspecting, wicked things to be fed and nurtured by worshipful parents until they reach the fullness of their power. An actual god construct behaving in the same way, perhaps changing its nasty little face as it hops from congregation to congregation like an ever-evolving parasite, really is quite intriguing. And with that, the cab pulls up to the coroner's office, the city morgue at East Armitage Street. Dr. Peabody greets you as you come into his office. Once again, my apologies and condolences on the loss of Wallace. He was, he was a good man. But, um, well, we can speak more freely here than we could at the cemetery. Um, I'll be frank. This was a very unusual case, uh, not least of which by, uh, well, 
well, the moths and whatnot, but um, Wallace's heart was entirely missing. It simply wasn't there. The, the chest cavity uh, contained remnants of a strange dust. Uh, under a microscope, it, it turned out to be like tiny scales, like those you'd find on the wings of a moth or a butterfly. Yes. I, I saw a similar case four or five years ago. One Richard McLuhan. Mr. McLuhan's wife had been very ill. She was sent away on a retreat, uh, some sort of health thing, but she came back no better. Possibly even worse, actually. I, I assumed that worry had led to McLuhan's heart attack, but, uh, well, it wasn't just cardiac failure, but much the same as in Wallace's case, the heart was entirely missing. I, I don't know who else to turn to, to be frank. I'm getting a lot of pressure to simply write cardiac failure on uh, my report and leave it at that. Of course. Higher ups. <laughs> a lot of money changes hands in Arkham. And, uh, well, I've been around long enough to know when uh, I'm getting serious hints to stop asking questions, but, well, I, I owe it to Wally. Thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, how long ago was this previous? Oh, as, as I say, four or five years. Uh, McLuhan's wife is, is still alive, actually. Uh, the shock, I assume, put her in a rather delicate state. Uh, she's uh, in the Whitechapel nursing home currently. Again, um, did you uh, discern anything from uh, Millicent? Uh, Professor Hunt, D did she have any pertinent information? Yeah, she had some, some really uh, interesting, I think, findings. Definitely unusual. Do you want to know? Should I not know? Would it be safer for me if I didn't? Perhaps if you have these higher ups um, pressuring you to keep quiet about these cases. These things are growing ever more dangerous. Perhaps it may be better if we don't drag some peoples along with us. Promise me you'll do right by Wallace. Of course. I think everyone here is in agreement with that. Yeah. So the, the plan is I, I just go along then? Go along to get along? Well, maybe, yeah. Maybe you'll be able to find something out along the way because like he said, none of this is normal. But, and uh, it's, yeah, we yeah. just don't want you to get in trouble for anything. Yes. All right, all right, that, nothing goes in the formal report, uh, nothing official, but. But if something else comes up, I mean, do let us know, please. Yes, Ben, so, tell me, what did she say about, about the moth? We think, it, God. Well, they were like, like ancient, they were old, like she hadn't seen them around. Mm -hmm. And some, something about them, like the, 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 the wings, the veins in their wings is, is, is not anything like, like a newer moth would have. And then, and then it had like, not just that, that the, what did you call that? Proboscis, 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 proboscis. Yeah, 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 that. It, not only did it have that, it had like mandibles and it had like teeth. And then something about the way it reproduced, it didn't reproduce normally. Asexually. Say yes, that way. Really? And it did remind her of uh, a drawing that she had seen in a book huh? at the Athenaeum Public Library. Which oh. we found. Oh, the, the, found. the Arkham Athenaeum, uh, not a public library per se, they're uh, more of a uh, scientific or a literary association, uh, very exclusive, of course. Right, uh, but the library has access to the public. Yes, yes, I, I do understand. They, they do allow that uh, sort of thing. Uh, I've. Uh, not frequented there myself. It's a bit stuffy for my taste, but uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, telling me. I'll, I'll keep my head down, but uh, you'll continue your inquiries? Of course. Yes. Good. Might I ask you something? Yes. Before 
Wallace passed, he had tasked us with a certain mystery to unfold, I suppose. And when I asked him how far we were allowed to pursue it, he kind of gave us the go ahead. Oh, well. So as a friend of Wallace's, uh, yourself, there might be things that happen in order to get to the bottom of this and do right by Wallace that aren't necessarily. Uh, is, is this uh, another thing that's probably better if I don't know about and uh, uh, plausible deniability and all that? Well, that's sort of what I'm getting at is just so you are in the know, I don't personally feel as though you have any sort of ill intent with any of this information. No, no. <clears throat> well, uh, I'll keep mum and... Uh, yeah, yes. keep your head down. Don't trust nobody. No. This... Miss McLuhan, who yeah. also had a similar affliction, that well, was... Uh, Mr. McLuhan, uh, who passed in the same way that Wally did. Uh, there was no report of uh, moths flying out of him, but as I say, the, the findings were there. The uh, heart was missing. There was a dust in the, in the chest cavity. So what did he do? What was his um, work? Oh, a man of business about town, a wealthy fellow. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, did Wally? You know, now that I think of it, I believe he had some association with the Athenaeum. Ah, you did? Ah. Hmm. Uh, as I say, his, uh, his wife is still with us, though uh, in a very delicate state. Uh, yes. Whitechapel nursing home. Uh, I don't know if questioning her would really bear any fruit, but um, I suppose you could try. Did Wallace uh, investigate that at all? Or was that before or after he retired? Oh. Oh, no, 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 he uh, didn't as far as I know, but, um, well, uh, there may be uh, case files, uh, certainly on uh, Mrs. McLuhan. Uh, the, the Whitechapel will have access to those. And as I say, the lady herself is still well, with us. Thank you. Uh, that'll be very helpful to get some more information as to what may be causing all this. Uh, do you ever get... Others that come through with questions or that pressure you in other ways besides those that work here? Do you see people come in and out? Well, this is Arkham. Uh, strange happenings and such. <laughs> but uh, no, not particularly. And, uh, of the Daughters of Grace come through here ever? Uh, oh, the charitable organization? Yes. Oh, not to my knowledge. Uh, no, not here. Very well. Um, I don't have any other questions, but... Making your way to the Whitechapel Nursing Home on 602 West Saltonstall Street, you find that Mrs. McLuhan is indeed a resident there, though she's apparently kept separate from everyone else. Uh, you speak to Dorothy Price, uh, the head nurse, she was apparently admitted by Dr. James Raven, who, according to the nurse, died some years ago of heart failure. But his files are still in storage in the back office of the nursing home. You present the card that Dr. Peabody gave you and are admitted to the file room. You're also told that you could see Mrs. McLuhan if you wished. Yeah, let's yeah. go see her. We'll, we'll uh, pursue that. Although, um, <clears throat> it might be useful if we somehow got our hands on those files. We definitely should take a look at that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. You are basically allowed to look at the files because Dr. Peabody has given you a cover story. Mm. Maybe we should check out the files first so we know kind of what we're going into. Going in, yes. And... Who, who is it that told us about her, the, the previous doctor 
Dr. Raven? Uh, this is the head nurse told you that Dr. Raven. So you think that that doctor also died a heart failure? Do you know, heart, yes. heart failure seems hard to believe at this point. So, the files of Dr. James Raven, the pertinent uh, information, begins on September 18th, 1923. Results of my work with Mrs. McLuhan continue to disappoint. My position here will enable me to keep an eye on her, and I have assured Richard that I will not give up. Richard McLuhan, her husband, who apparently died in the same way as Wallace Phillips. I have assured Richard that I will not give up, but I think that we've come as far as we can. All I can do now is prescribe appropriate medication and attempt to keep her stable. It is at this stage I must recognize my own hubris. It was my assumption that I would be able to apply my superior medical training to Herbert West's equipment and notes and achieve better result than his experiments did. It was my genuine hope that his this work could do good. I shall not give up research. Humanity will always seek ways to remain young and vital, to cheat death and disease. And I remain convinced that we are on the verge of finding the answer. However, I shall make no further attempts until I can more thoroughly assess where we have gone wrong. October 12, 1923. A rather fascinating development. Socrates has invited me to the club with claims of a new procedure. Mm. How we came upon such a thing I cannot fathom, though these gentlemen are possessed of financial resources a lowly medical man such as I often lack. I am intrigued to hear his findings. October 16th. 1923. Again, a disappointment, though a surprising one in this instance, that a man of such logic and reason could be taken in by such hokum. Pond mud? Question mark. Ludicrous. Probably relatively harmless, but still ludicrous. October 29th, 1923. Met with Socrates again to attempt to convince him of his moral turpitude of his the, convince him of the moral turpitude of pursuing his proposed course of action. He was at first hostile, then became agreeable, and assured me that my objections were noted and would be taken seriously. But I am worried that he may have already proceeded. I myself have become unwell. Perhaps the overbearing worry is taking its toll on my constitution. Heart palpitations. November 5th, 1923. Continued weakness and dizziness has become difficult to leave my bed. I am treating with camphor and aconite. Should probably seek a second opinion, but medical men do make the worst patients. <laughs> a truism I regretfully acknowledge. I am sure that rest will do the trick. The end notes end here, and he apparently died shortly thereafter. Is it he was treating her before her husband's death. I, I thought she had been brought in or charged after he had died. I did not realize. According to what you read, she underwent some treatment. Yeah, before. With her like husband. The thing yes. about cheating death and remaining young mm -hmm. sounded Herbert. a lot like uh, that wife that came back a lot more beautiful. Mm hmm. And also, hear me out on well, this. Yes. This might be a reach, but this Socrates he was seeing reminded me awful lot about that coat rack that we saw that had all the philosophers. Yes. Oh, I'm with you. Indeed. So maybe that's just a nickname. the nickname for whoever holds that. Yes. I agree. Area. And more and more, especially since reading that addendum on our drive over, I think there's something, there's something untoward, something off with the Daughters of Grace. I, I do not think that they are the charitable organization they are putting themselves out to be. I, I think it is okay, all no. on a ruse of some sort, but what exactly are they doing? And they say it they all, are. It all stinks. They say they're, all they're helping young women, but what are they doing? How are they helping them exactly? But we met Peppa, and reading all of these documents, it might be that they think that they are doing good and they are not. Yes. Shall we meet the woman herself then? <sighs> you were taken by the head nurse to meet with Mrs. McLuhan. 
As you enter the room, she's sitting on the edge of the bed, facing the wall. As you approach, she smells strangely of cinnamon and damp meat. Her skin is graying. She's wearing a hospital gown. Her hair is lank. And though Whitechapel is a home for the elderly, she's probably in her late 40s. Staring intently at a crack in the wall. She's like this all the time. Mrs. McLuhan. At the mention of her name, she suddenly snaps towards you and lunges, stopping at the end of a chain, clawing, her eyes glazed, drool running down her face. She hasn't done that in a while, says the nurse. And as you stare to the gray face of Mrs. McLuhan, flecks of spittle flying from her open mouth, from which comes a sound. Oh, no. <laughs> no words, only strangled gasping. We will bring this episode of Graveyards of Arkham to a close. Thank you for watching.